Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> our text for this morning's sermon is from that gospel reading in Luke chapter 9. There is no looking back. Our Lord Christ has just turned his face toward Jerusalem, the holy city. The days have drawn near, the time has come. Jesus knows well what awaits him when he gets to Jerusalem. And he turns to face it like a soldier marching the long road to battle. This is a pivotal moment in Luke's gospel and in the ministry of Christ. Moses and Elijah spoke with Jesus about his exodus on the Mount of Transfiguration not too long ago. And this is that exodus. It's fulfilled at Jerusalem in his suffering, death, and resurrection, and he turns to face it. Christ doesn't hide his face from mockings. He doesn't hide his face from sufferings. He doesn't hide his face from humiliation and death. Rather, the suffering servant turns to face it. He is determined to go to Jerusalem and to the cross. And he knows that there is no looking back. And this is exactly what he must teach his disciples. Christ sends messengers before him into a Samaritan village. We don't know exactly what they said, but we do know their message had to be about the coming of the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God comes in Christ, and Christ is coming. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. The Jews and the Samaritans don't get along. Perhaps this is why they reject Jesus. But of course, as we know, Jesus is often rejected by all kinds of people, not just the Samaritans. After all, he's going to Jerusalem where his own people will reject him. But this event with the Samaritans gets under the skin of two apostles, James and John. The sons of thunder say, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What a bold request from these two disciples. They certainly don't like people rejecting their Lord. They want to destroy this village. Just like the Lord did to Sodom and Gomorrah way back in Genesis when the fire came down from heaven, and the wrath of God consumed it. But the brothers James and John don't realize Christ's purpose on this earth. God's judgment doesn't come in the form of fire and sulfur from heaven as it did in the days of Sodom. Remember, there's no looking back. Rather, Christ later says about this fire, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. Our Lord is, ref is referring to his crucifixion, where the fire of God's wrath is poured out on himself for the sins of the world. And so Christ doesn't concern himself with this Samaritan city and their rejection of him, for God's wrath isn't directed at it. It is true that if this city continues to reject the Messiah, then one day it certainly shall be brought down to Hades. But not this day. This day, Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. This day, there is no looking back to the days of Sodom. The consuming fire of God's judgment is to be aimed at himself on the cross. Christ has not come to judge and destroy evil cities. Rather, he has come to be judged and crucified for sinful people. And so he rebukes James and John, and they move on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. This man certainly means well. He wants to follow in Christ's footsteps. But the problem is, Jesus' destination is not of this world. Jesus said to him, foxes have, holes and, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Christ is homeless as he walks along this earth. He is on a journey through this world, an exodus, not to make a home 
in this world. So to journey with our Lord means departing from all that belongs to the world. He doesn't rest on this journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. He has no place to lay his head. Therefore, to be his disciples requires following him along this hard road that leads to crucifixion, death, and yes, eventual resurrection. And so there is no looking back to the comforts of the world. But Jesus still has more to teach his disciples. He says to another, follow me. But that man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. If there's a reasonable request, that certainly seems like one. Burial is important. Honor thy father and mother. And mother. And one way to do that was burial. And the Jews buried people quickly, oftentimes the same day that they died. It seems that this man would only be gone a short while. But Christ says, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Well, that sounds a little harsh to our ears, doesn't it? But Jesus is explaining to his disciples that the call to be a disciple, one of the 72 who he will send out to preach, requires a radical reorientation of one's priorities. All earthly cares, even family ties, take a back seat to the proclamation of the kingdom of God. His father might have died an earthly death, but this man is called by Jesus to preach the gospel so that men would not die an eternal death. And the same goes for the third man in today's reading. He says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Again, this seems to be a reasonable request. But the man attaches a condition to his discipleship, which leads Christ to respond, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. There can be no conditions attached to being a disciple. There is no looking back. Of course, family is still important as Christ says, as Christ says elsewhere. But it is subordinate for these whom Christ is sending into the world to proclaim his life-saving gospel. And surely it will be difficult for these disciples. This type of radical following of Christ will set them apart from the world. It will even distinguish them from their earthly families. As Jesus later says in chapter 12, From now on in one house there will be five divided Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. It's going to be difficult. But this is the reality of being Jesus' disciple. He comes first. The kingdom of God comes first. Those who look back to the comforts of this world, or leave Christ, even for their family are unfit for the kingdom of God. So, oh, how unfit we all must be. Let me explain Jesus' point with an analogy. I like watching baseball, and I'm sure many of you do as well, but let's face it, the simple fact and part of the enjoyable experience of watching baseball is that it honestly doesn't demand that much attention from us. Whether you're an avid fan or turn it on occasionally, it's very easy to go about doing other things while watching baseball. Cue in for the home run or the double down the line, keep an eye on the good pitching duel, but as long as you don't miss the important things, you can go outside to grill up some burgers, grab a beer from the fridge, call up a friend, or pretty much anything else you want to do. Just tune in for the big plays, Catch the highlights, and you'll be okay. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not how you follow Jesus. This is not what it means to be a disciple. Whether you've been a lifelong member of the body of Christ, or you, re- or you recently became part of the church, following Jesus isn't a casual pastime like watching baseball. You can't go looking back to the comforts of the world instead of following him. Whether it's once or often, we tend to do exactly that. We tend to look back to the desires of our flesh and to what this world has to offer. Think about the many things that we so often put ahead of Christ. Things such as work, long family vacations, sporting events, and so on, are good things, but they become a problem when they get in the way of us following our Lord Christ, when they come first. So Luke 9, this text, is a call for us to examine ourselves. Think about it. What is your condition for following Christ? How would you finish the sentence of the second man? I will follow you, Lord. But let me first. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this can be quite difficult for us. This can be difficult because sometimes following Jesus can cause divisions in the things that we love, as Christ himself told us. For example, many families are divided because one or more are Christians while others are not. How many fathers today don't come to church with their families? How many children leave the faith as soon as they aren't living under their parents' roof? Divisions do exist. Christ said they would. And now I want to be perfectly clear, and it may go without saying, but here it is anyway. Jesus has not called you to leave your family and proclaim the kingdom of God like he did with the disciples in Luke chapter 9. Likewise, you are not called to forsake your family and the comfort of your own home and wander about throughout the world with no place to lay your head. For Jesus has not called you to follow him to Jerusalem like he has these disciples. But Jesus has called you to follow him into eternal life. And that does mean that you are called to be his disciple, keeping him at the forefront of all you do and not treating your faith like some casual pastime that remains turned on in the background. You are called to continuously hear his word and to do it. He has baptized you and made you part of God's family, the eternal family that matters above all else and which is not divided. He knows things might get difficult. He said they would. He knows you might look back to the things of this world, but he continues to preach to you through his word the very same words that he said in Luke chapter 9. Follow me. He continues to call to you, to bring to you back to himself so that you may finish the journey, your exodus, to heaven victoriously. And if you do look back to the comforts, to the earthly comforts and sinful desires of this world, if you do put these things above and in front of Christ, never be afraid to come and confess to repent those sins, repent of those sins, and hear his word of forgiveness. Confidently come before your Lord and confess, and then confidently know that you are forgiven. Trust in the fact that where we fail, Christ succeeded on our behalf. There was no looking back on his journey to Jerusalem and to the cross, even when it meant a bloody and painful death on account of your sin and on account of the wrath of God. For he, the faithful one, faithfully gave himself up for you, a sinner, so that he might call you to die with him, to rise with him, 
and to follow him into everlasting life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We stand for the offertory.